Good morning, Turn Point family. My name is Derek. And I'm Tori. And we want to welcome you guys to our Easter celebration this morning. Uh, we're so excited that we get to get together like this online. Uh, it's so cool. We're all in our living rooms or our cars or we're on our phones, laptops, <laughs> and we get to enjoy being together uh, for Easter Sunday. It happened. It happened. <laughs> uh, anyway, my, um, my wife and I, we lead the young adult ministry here, and uh, we're so excited that we get to be together like this. We're going to have a really great time together this morning. We're going to get to worship together, and then we're going to get to hear a great message from our senior pastor, Kevin Holland. If you're joining us for the first time today, we want to say welcome. Or uh, if you're looking to just get more information about our church community, we want to invite you to check out our website, which is www.turningpointla.org. We promise to uh, get back to you and keep in touch and help you get connected. Yeah. And we know that everyone is experiencing crazy times right now. It's unprecedented. And uh, right now it's a little easy to feel a lack of hope. And so we believe that Jesus and the resurrection gives us a reason uh, to have hope. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. That's what the lesson is going to be about. It's finding hope. We're just so glad that you joined us today. And we pray that you are encouraged by spending your morning with us. Now let's turn it over to Jay and Tracy Miner and Shauna Johnson, who are going to lead us in our time of worship to our God. Here we go. Hey, I'm so glad to see everybody this morning. Thank you, Derek and Tori. And uh, I also want to say Happy Easter. It's really great to have everybody here. Uh, we're going to have a great time together today. So thank you for joining us online uh, today. Uh, we're going to sing uh, some incredible songs because there's something about singing that really moves our hearts and softens our hearts and opens us up uh, and helps us to be able to connect better and communicate better. So uh, I'd love for you to sing along with us. We're going to sing a great song right now about how love changes everything. Here we go. I see his body breaking. I see his fingers bleed. I see the darkness tremble like the ground below his feet. In the darkest hours, there on Calvary, he was sweetly broken, broken beautifully, broken beautifully. Come on to the waters, come let the broken sing. All your sons and daughters, his love changes everything. Come when the fear is fighting, you find in the risen King. Come on and let the light and your love changes everything. And when the heaven saw the sins of men become a crown of glory as you died and rose again in the darkest hour in the valley Everything. Your love, your love, your love changes everything. Your love, your love, your love changes everything. And I can overcome when death has lost its sting. Your love, your love, your love. Oh, oh, oh. 
good to be able to sing stuff like that uh i'm also really happy to have shauna with us today uh thank you for shauna for coming over she's like about 12 feet over that way though so uh which is good but uh we're gonna sing uh some more about jesus just how great he is here we go the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are good good oh you are good you're good oh let the king of my heart
never gonna let me down Cause you are good, you're good Boy, you are good, good Boy, you are good, good Boy, you are good, you're good Happy Easter, everyone. I miss everyone, and I wish I could give you all a great big hug right now. You know, I'm so grateful to be able to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Um, today is a day where we honor Jesus, that we are thankful, that we celebrate new hope and new beginnings and forgiveness and purpose and redemption. And I think in this season it means so much more now because of the chaos in the world to be able to focus on Jesus and to give thanks. One of my favorite passages is in Matthew 11. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Jesus' words were from our heart then as well as today and for yours as well. I was a college gal in Tallahassee, Florida when I first met Jesus, and now, almost 38 years later, as a wife, as a mom, in my career, as a friend, Jesus has taught me how to be in all of those areas. He's answered all of my questions, he's offered rest, he's carried my loads, he's eased my doubts, I have a place to belong, a place of hope, a place of rest, and a place for my heart and my mind and my soul. And I think now more than ever, I am, more, I am so grateful for that because the world feels very big and very scary and it's full of anxiety and it's full of fear. And Jesus says, if you come to me, I will give you rest. And I'm grateful for that. On the last night of his life, Jesus, Jesus shared his last supper with his followers. And ever since, his followers have shared in communion. Communion is a time to remember Jesus and his life, his sacrifice the Son of God leaving heaven and coming to live as a man and offering his life for us in exchange uh, for my sins so that I can have a relationship with God. It was a time when I remember when I, when I lived apart from God. Ephesians 2 simply says, I lived in this world without God and without hope. No peace and stuck with the worst parts of myself. The rescue came with the cross. The rescue came with Jesus' resurrection. That's where the hope comes. Communion is also a time to renew. Renew my choice to follow Jesus in every area of my heart and my mind and my life. And lastly, a time, it's a time to rejoice, to celebrate uh, all the good that God has done and give thanks for the things that he's done and that he would continue to do. For those of us who are Jesus followers, we know what this is. We do this every Sunday. And hopefully today in our new normal, it means so much more. For those of us who are curious to know more about Jesus, he offers the promise that I just shared in that passage in Matthew 11. There's no one like him. He will meet you where you are. He will fill in the dark places. He will help you. He will guide you. He will show you why you were created. He will show you the path to God. He will offer you and uh, the forgiveness that God gives and show you that there are ways to live so much more than just yourself. And so today, at this moment, we're about to take communion. It's something that Christians have done over the past 2,000 years. If you have something, now is the time that you would take it. The bread represents Jesus' body, and the drink that you have represents the blood that he shed for the forgiveness of our sins. So let's pray right now. Father, we are grateful for another day of life. Your breath allows us to move and exist. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us Jesus so that we may know you more fully. We can't fully comprehend the cost, but we are grateful. Thank you for forgiving us. We love you. Jesus, it's in your good name that we pray and we give thanks. Amen.
head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at his feet we
I Turning Point, Happy Easter. Uh, it is great to be virtually connected and want to say hi to all of our members, also family members, friends, uh, neighbors, guests from all over. Uh, it's great to be connected in these bizarre times. Now, I have to tell you, 2019 for me was a pretty chaotic year. I don't know if you can relate. There was a lot going on. There was a lot of confusion and disorder, and I was looking forward to coming into 2020 to have a blissful, peaceful, calm, you know, sane year. And so, lo and behold, we here we are, and we come into this new year, this new decade, and I've never uh, experienced anything like it. So I have to say that, uh, you know, we started the beginning of the year in January. Our church, a great theme, uh, but as for TPC, as, but as for Turning Point Church, we really wanted to focus on community groups and living together in community as well. Uh, we talked about loving and serving and giving and sharing and uh, doing all the things that God want, wanted us to do. And so we had a great uh, series, January, the same in February with a series called Trust the Story. And then our worlds got turned upside down. Uh, it's been really incredible to see all the ways that our lives are different now. And uh, I remember my wife, Trey, got a text alert uh, and she made an audible gasp uh, back when we heard about this. And because the whole city was being shut down, you know, I was still going to 24 Hour Fitness, which is my happy place, doing my thing and, you know, looking forward to watching the Lakers and Clippers. And in one fell swoop, all the gyms were closed and no more sports on TV. And I'm just like, the world is ending right here. Uh, and so it's been, you know, uh, what I thought would be less chaotic ended up being more chaotic. It's interesting uh, when you think about uh, our lives now, uh, there's, it, in some ways there's no way to escape and we're all in a situation where we're not in control and we just have to uh, trust that God is good and that he's got a, a better plan ahead. That's what we want to talk about today. In fact, God, as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, God specializes in turning crucifixions into resurrections. He specializes in bringing good out of bad. And a lot of the work that he's done throughout history and some of the most inspiring uh, and noble works have come out of chaotic times. In fact, Jesus was born into chaos. Uh, the last week of his life, we celebrated Palm Sunday last Sunday. And uh, the, the last week of his life, the Sunday before uh, the first Easter, he rode into Jerusalem and was cheered by many while others were plotting to take his life. And so there was political chaos. You had the tension between the Roman government and also the temple leaders, the Jewish priests. You had uh, the disciples that Jesus, uh, his, his closest friends, his most trusted followers, had no idea when he was predicting his death, they didn't get it. It makes me feel better reading scriptures today and not understanding some, some of them. They were with the man. They were with the Son of God and didn't understand a lot of what he was teaching because it was beyond uh, their pay grade. And so none of his, Jesus' disciples toward the end of his life, the last week of his life, of course, he clears the temple on Tuesday and Thursday, has the Last Supper celebrating Passover and spending uh, this really uh, poignant, these poignant moments with his disciples, just, you know, sharing his last words. Guys, I want you to love each other uh, as I have loved you, and I want you to serve each other, and the greatest needs to be a servant, all this. And not only do none of his disciples stay faithful in the moment toward his crucifixion, but one of the people that he's invested three years of his life in is plotting to betray him. And so uh, there's relational chaos, there's political chaos, there's spiritual chaos. And uh, all of this is just a part of what God understands is going on and, and what's going to need to happen. But God brings peace and calm out of chaos. And that's what he was working to do. And that's what he did through this time. Of course, we know that Jesus was arrested. He was cruelly beaten and uh, he suffered and was tortured. And then on uh, Friday morning, he was crucified. And uh, it was a death that was horrendous. It was, it was reserved. It was, it was the most painful, worst, most humiliating, demeaning form of torture and form of murder that the Romans could come up with. And they visited it on someone who had done nothing but love and give life and had no sin. And so he was crucified on that Friday. 
All the disciples were scattered. They were heartbroken. It was, it was a total worst case scenario. And I know that uh, many of us, we, we've had those times where we felt like we were at the bottom. We were, we were uh, at our complete wits end. Our hearts are broken. We're devastated. And it doesn't look like there's any hope. But God is the author of hope. And out of this heartbreaking situation where it seemed like evil won and Satan won, God still had another thing coming. I do know that uh, we have some members in our church, and perhaps many of you that are watching, perhaps that are not members, but all of us are members of the human family, and all of us are hurting and grieving over uh, the toll that the coronavirus has taken on our nation and on individuals. And I know of uh, some people that are dear friends of mine that have lost loved ones as recently in the pa as the past couple of weeks because uh, they've lost them to uh, COVID-19. And I want to say from the bottom of my heart, my heart breaks. It, it does literally ache for the loss and suffering that so many are going through. And if that's you, please hear me. I am so sorry for your loss. Understand that God knows he loves you, he's for you, he's with you, and he can help you grieve and, and uh, begin the process of healing and moving toward uh, what, what is next in the future. But let's, let's be real, you know, real talk. Uh, it's a tough time and a lot of us are hurting and uh, we need God now more than ever. The Saturday after uh, Jesus was crucified was perhaps the most bleak and darkest day in history. And you can imagine, let's say you're a Jesus follower and you've spent three and a half years of your life following this guy around and so many of your hopes, he's the Messiah, he's the one that's going to redeem Israel, uh, comes on the scene and you see people healed and you see people loved and you see the forgotten cared for and then all of a sudden it's over and, and it's just, it's devastating. And yet, fortunately, Sunday was yet to come. And Sunday, God did the most incredible miracle in the history, creation of the world. He raised Jesus from the dead. And we have several accounts of that uh, incredible event that are found in the New Covenant in the New Testament. There are actually four accounts of the resurrection. And I want to read in Luke chapter 24. Luke was an historian and a doctor who recorded these events and accounts. And uh, he has some, some things written that I think will really be encouraging for us to look at in Luke 24. So if you want to uh, flip on your phone or uh, turn to the scriptures in Luke 24, verse 1, it says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while you were still with him in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners and be crucified on the third day and be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Here you have these women who were, were super close to Jesus. And it's what's interesting. You, you may think, hey, you know, I have a lot of doubts. It's hard for me to believe that someone was physically raised from the dead. It's, I'm a bit of a skeptic. It's really hard for me to wrap my brain around that, my mind around that. Well, if you feel that way, you're in great company. Because not only do most of us come from that point of view, but none of Jesus' closest followers none of them expected him to rise from the dead. He told them over and over again, and they just didn't believe it. It was nonsensical. And so they, they were skeptical, and so they go to the tomb, and they find it empty, and they don't think he's risen. They think someone stole the body or something else. Then these angels appear, and they say, guys, it's exactly what Jesus said. He had to go to the cross and be crucified. Why? Because God sees the same thing that we see. And the same thing that he saw 2,000 years ago. The world is broken. Nothing works right in this world. Relationships don't work correctly. Our health doesn't work right. Uh, you see the things that happen in this world. The way that one group of people treats another group. The way that 
individuals treat each other and you're thinking, how did we get here? Something's wrong. Now, we don't all agree on the source of the problem, but we all get something's broken and wrong in this world. And the biblical worldview is that man, you and I, and our forebearers have chosen to try to live apart from God, which is the definition of sin. It is to, to put me in the place of God and to put my will ahead of God's will as a cre creature putting my will ahead of the creator, which has gotten us all into the mess that we're in. And the truth is you and I both know we have issues that we don't know how to solve. We have things about us that we wish were different. And you say, well, I wish God would just wipe out all evil and you know everybody that does anything wrong, right? And th in that case, all of us would immediately evaporate because let's be honest, all of us have issues in our own lives that we can't overcome or we feel like we, we, we're defeated by. Not only do we not live up to God's standard, we often don't live up to our own standard. And it's not just someone saying, hey, you did that wrong. In our hearts, we know, man, I know that I'm not living the way I, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have treated that person that way. I shouldn't have done that. And so we live with the, this constant state of, I know something not only is wrong with the world, but it's wrong with me. Think about this. We don't all just, we, there, aren't a, there aren't such things as Christian problems and then non-Christian problems. They're basically just human problems, right? Most of us feel like we don't have enough money. All of us that are married are trying to figure it out and we have similar issues. Those of us that are single, we have challenges that are like other singles. All of us wonder what really happens when we die. All of us need friends. All of us at times are lonely. All of us deal with uh, the challenge of needing to forgive. All of us have people that have hurt us and it's a struggle to forgive. All of us have hurt other people. And it's hard to, to, to sometimes accept forgiveness. We all need friends. We're all plagued to one degree or another by guilt. Man, I wish I hadn't done that. Or resentment, I wish they hadn't done that to me. And this is the human condition. We see it rage. We see our, our nation more uh, polarized. And there's so much hatred. And then you go online, good grief. I mean, it just you just wish, how can someone say and do those things to people? You want to know why did Jesus have to die? He had to die to rescue us from that empty, hopeless, pointless way of life that were it not for the resurrection of Jesus, we wouldn't have any hope to overcome. But the good news of Easter Sunday is that Jesus overcame death. Because of that, we have the promise of being able to overcome death. And not only that, the people that chose to follow him actually changed the way they lived and Jesus made their lives better and he made them better at life and that's the promise that he has for all of us today no matter where we are following Jesus listen to me following Jesus will make your life better and will make you better at life it won't solve every problem and make everything evaporate but as Jesus said to his followers in John chapter 16 hey I want you to have my peace in this world you'll have trouble and we all say yep that's right. He says, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And to the degree that I choose to follow Jesus, to that degree, I can overcome the world. Well, Jesus went on after his resurrection to appear to several people, hundreds of people actually, over a few weeks' time. And five times uh, that are recorded in Luke 24 to his followers and his disciples. He even had one of his followers who was named Doubting Thomas, who wasn't there with the original group that he appeared to. And Thomas wouldn't believe it. And so then Jesus had a command performance and appearance to Thomas to tell him to stop doubting and believing. Uh, Thomas actually was, was like most of us, so I'm not down on Thomas. I'm just saying there were doubters then and there are uh, their doubters now, but Jesus showed himself and he proved it. Now, uh, there are some people that have a challenge thinking about believing the resurrection. And I love a quote by uh, N.T. Wright. He's a great uh, biblical scholar. He's one of the leading New Testament scholars. He says that the best evidence uh, the best explanation, rather, for the rise of the early church is that Jesus really rose from the dead because there's no denying all of his followers believed that he rose from the dead. You don't go to, uh, go to your death at the hands of the lions uh, under Nero and you don't suffer the way they suffered for myth or hallucination or a lie.
And there are people who say, hey, well, I just can't, I can't believe in a resurrection. But then I would challenge you, so what is your explanation for the birth of the Christian church, this Jewish sect that changes the way that people worship from hundreds of years prior the worship day changing from the Sabbath Saturday to the first day of the week Sunday and all these other different details. There is so much historical evidence for the physical resurrection of Jesus. But as well, there are the transformed lives of millions, billions of people who say that Jesus is Lord and you will see people literally transform. And for me, that is the chief evidence uh, that I base my belief in the resurrection from because I have seen hundreds of people and I have seen God change me. I've seen him change others in my life that can only be explained by the supernatural power of following a man who rose from the dead. So we flash forward in Luke's second book and that's the book of Acts and in Acts chapter 2 this is uh, approximately 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. There was another Jewish feast after the Passover called Pentecost. And there are thousands of God-fearing Jews from all over the Mediterranean basin in Jerusalem celebrating as they had for hundreds of years. During this time, uh, Peter, some of the followers that had uh, abandoned Jesus, appeared and they, once they saw him raised from the dead, that's when they finally got it. And that's when they said, okay, I didn't believe it, but now I have seen this guy, I have eaten with him, and I'm going to give the rest of my life to proclaiming his death, burial, and resurrection, and that's what they did. And that little band of men and women changed the world, and now there are over 2 billion Jesus followers in the, in the 21st century, but it began there in this small group. So they're all together at Pentecost celebrating this Jewish feast, and uh, Peter, who is one of the main uh, Jesus followers and apostles of that day stands up and reads this. Therefore let all the house of Israel know beyond a doubt that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. And so he stands up and all these people, they, they weren't around during that time. They were, the Roman soldiers actually physically crucified Jesus. But the Jewish leaders and by extension, the sins of, of the aggregate population, uh, which necessitated Jesus giving his life, he says, you, by the hands of wicked men, crucified Jesus. And they heard that they had made this person, who uh, God had said was Lord and Christ, they had uh, caused him to be crucified. And it says uh, in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles what should we do brothers and Peter replies to them repent and each one of you should be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away as many as the Lord our God will call to himself with many other words he testified and exhorted them saying save yourselves from this perverse generation so they accepted his message and were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to this beginning, brand new church. The truth is, in this time, in a matter of, of, of several weeks, God brought people from chaos to an incredible community that was brand new and heretofore hadn't been seen in the world. They say, what do we do? We, we crucified Jesus. How do we respond to that? And he says, I want you to repent. And I know that's a religious word. It just means to change your mind. It just means to change the way you think. He says, I want you to change the way you think about God, about Jesus, about uh, how you treat other people, about your money, about how you, uh, your relational life, your social life. I want you to change the way you think. And then I want you to be baptized to share in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus to begin a new life. And all these people from all these different nations hear the message, they respond, and 3,000 people, this is the birthday of of this Jesus community. It's the birthday of the church. 3,000 people join. And in verse 42, uh, they go on, uh, uh, Luke goes on and he talks about what characterized this community that was brought out of chaos. He says, the community continually committed themselves to learning what the apostles taught them, gathering for fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone felt a sense of awe because the apostles were doing many signs and wonders among them. There was an intense sense of togetherness among all who believed. They shared all their material possessions and trust. They sold any possessions and goods that didn't benefit the community and used the money to help everyone in need. They were unified as they worshiped at the temple day after day. At homes, they broke bread and shared meals 
and with glad and generous hearts. And I love this. The new disciples praised God and they enjoyed the goodwill of all the people of the city. And then it says, day after day, the Lord added to their number everyone who was experiencing liberation. I love how it characterizes this new community that was brought out of chaos. Actually, the title of this message was From Chaos to Community. And that's what God does. That's what God did then, and that's what he does now. He took the chaos of the uh, crucifixion, all that had become, come before that, because he had a plan to bring out of that a community of people that were diverse, demographically different in terms of their, their thinking and in every other way, but were unified in one main thing. They had all said, Jesus is Lord. I'm going to devote the rest of my life to giving everything I have to lifting up Jesus and to treating people the way that he asked me to treat other people. And this Jesus community that uh, began here in Acts 2 nearly 2,000 years ago is what we get a chance to experience today. And honestly, uh, the Turning Point Church, the Turning Point family, I am so happy that you've gotten a chance to join us virtually and, and be a part of our community. It's the thing, one of the things that we're so, I, I feel so uh, grateful for. Uh, I love our family and we're very different. We're all over. We've got uh, community groups that are all over the San Fernando Valley, all over LA, some in Santa Carita, some in South Pass, La Cañada, West Hills, Encino, Culver City. We're all over Burbank, uh, Sherman Oaks. We're all over the place. And the truth is we're trying our very best to be a community of Jesus followers that mimics, that imitates this original community that uh, we read about, where we love each other, we do life together. Uh, there's nothing that, that can happen that will separate us from trying to help each other, sharing our possessions, uh, enjoying life together, eating together, you know, uh, just experiencing all that life has to offer together. And even now, staying at home virtually, I mean, uh, staying at home, but virtually being together. And honestly, uh, it's a joy to uh, be able to share, uh, show this video to you. Uh, we did a video recently of a number of our members who are Jesus followers. They're very different, but they were able to share the difference that becoming a Jesus follower made in their lives. And they were able to share the impact that God had in their lives as he took them from chaos in their own personal life to being part of a remarkable community of people that love Jesus. So take a look at this. Before I started to follow Jesus, I thought everything depended on me. I thought I had to be perfect. I had to overcome all my weaknesses in order to be loved. I always seeked validation from others. I never thought that I was good enough. And I just looked at life as I just need to achieve. And even though I had accomplished some level of success, I still didn't feel good at the end of every day. Didn't want to be around people, um, mostly because I didn't want to be hurt by anyone. Uh, my relationship with my wife was on rocky road. It was just a very broken cycle of life. I was very much a control freak. I didn't trust. I couldn't stay sober. I couldn't stay clean. Uh, there was nothing in my power that I could do no matter how bad I wanted it. I just was totally incapable of turning my life around. Before following Jesus, before actually committing my life to Jesus, I felt a lot of chaos. I couldn't breathe. There wasn't enough headspace to think. Now I feel at peace. It wasn't until I got involved in a community of people who were following Jesus um, that I saw some change in my life. Self-worth and joy. It just blows my mind until now that somebody like Jesus Christ is attracted to a sinner like me. Um, I, right now I feel, I feel loved and um, accepted. I am enough because he chose to lay down his life for me. Becoming a woman of integrity. Since I've followed Jesus, I know that I am worthy just because I'm me. That I don't have to do anything to be worthy. I don't have to do anything to be loved. I have hope. 
I mean, I was truly broken. I was hopeless. I would have rather have died. And uh, that was at just the time, I think, that Jesus said, I can work with that. Healing. And he never stopped like pursuing and just finding me and rescuing me. I feel loved and free. A joy, a peace. Calm, empathy. Every question I had about my self-worth and who I was is answered. Now, it's very, very hard to get me riled, very hard to get me upset. I think the thing that's changed for me since I've followed Jesus is really my capacity to love others. It has changed and transformed my marriage. It's taught me how to die to my own feelings and put her feelings above my own. I think about how much of a better mom I am today because of Jesus' heart. Now I think uh, relationships are so important, community is so important because that's, that's how I see God interacting with us. Now my life is about uh, helping people, it's about loving people. That selfish person turned into a selfless person. I've been able to think about others and how I can just teach them about Jesus um, instead of always focusing on myself. Every day I wake up and it's just totally different. There is hope. I have just started my life. Like, this is the beginning. It's been better than I ever could have imagined. I have to tell you, I love, love, love that video because it is such an accurate depiction and expression of the life change that I have seen hundreds of times over many years because people choose to follow Jesus and choose to give their lives and connect to a Jesus community. Uh, the fact of the matter is we have to follow Jesus for ourselves, all of us individually for our own relationship with God, reconciliation to God, and salvation have got to follow Jesus for ourselves and not for someone else, not to please anybody else. So we must follow Jesus for ourselves, but we cannot follow him by ourselves. And I know for me, uh, when I different uh, times that I attempted to grow in my spirituality or grow in my walk with God, if I was not connected to a local Jesus community, I ended up, it was an exercise in futility. There's just a power. And think about it. God could have uh, changed the world or he could have brought salvation in any number of ways. But he decided that the, the fruit of Jesus' resurrection and the fruit of what, what would be left is this family, this community, this ecclesia, this group of disparate people that were brought together, that loved like no one else loved, that cared like no one else cared, that served like no one else served, and that tried, their, their primary ambition in life was to be like Jesus. And that is the way that God changed the world. And it's still the way that he changes the world. And I know that he's changed so many of us. So I want to invite you. We would love to connect with you. In fact, if you're interested, I know that some of you, uh, that God has gotten your attention. You've been thinking a lot and you really are, are at the point where you want to make uh, a big step toward learning about God. Uh, perhaps you want to be baptized. Perhaps you want to, uh, you know, turn your life over. Perhaps you want to become a Jesus follower or you just want to study about uh, the resurrection or study about other things. And if that's you, we would love to study the Bible with you. Others of you are looking for community and in fact we've got great community groups, uh, scores of them, dozens of them all throughout LA as I talked about and in fact many of them are going to be meeting right after this virtually via Zoom video conferencing and other video conferencing modes and they would love for you to just you know uh, after uh, this uh, this service jump right in and you could uh, jump in and join them also some of you may just have things that are on your heart and you just want prayer and I know it encourages me to know when I'm hurting over something that hundreds thousands of people some of whom I've not even met are praying about that and so I want to give you a number to text uh, these keywords to if you're interested in studying the Bible text the word study okay the word study to 818 979-9706.
If you're interested in joining one of our community groups right away, right after this is done, then text the word community to 818-797-9706. And if you're interested, if you just have something on your heart, you want to talk to somebody or to give them a prayer request, ask them, please pray for me about this, then text the word pray to 818-979-9706. So please do that. We would love to connect with you. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, Instagram, all over at uh, Turning Point LA. And then if you want to email us, you can email us at connect at turningpointla.org. We love you. We're going to make it through this together. God specializes in turning crucifixions into resurrections. There is hope. He brings community out of chaos, and he has a community that he wants you to be a part of. You are not alone. We love you. Thank you so much for being a part of our Easter gathering. God bless. Amen. Thank you, Kevin, for that message. It is really great just to be reminded about how God loves to bring life from death and he loves to bring community out of chaos. Uh, he does that in our lives and he wants to do that in the church as well. It takes things that are broken and turn them into something beautiful. And uh, we're all trying to figure out how to do that together. So it's a good thing. So right now we're going to sing about Jesus because he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords and he is the name above all names. So let's just praise him now.
My name is Samantha Lamb, and I am the director of our children's ministry Kids Point here at the Turning Point Church. I wanted to send you a quick message and let you know that I wish you all a very Merry Easter and that we really, really miss seeing all of your children in our classes. We had a great event planned for you this year called Road to Resurrection. It's actually our fourth year of producing this event, and we're very sad that we weren't able to have this event for you, but we will have it next year, and it's gonna be amazing, even better than it would have been this year. I really believe that. In the meantime, we've sent out a video with some clips of children sharing about their experience and clips of the actual event for you to be able to experience just a little bit of what we were going to do. We also had all of the teachers in their individual classes send out messages to their children. And some of these videos are really, really cute. I encourage you to go watch them if you have children, especially for the, the teachers of your child's class. You can see all these videos on both our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. <sighs> we really, really miss seeing all of you and really miss being able to connect with you all. If you have any questions or anything that you need any support or prayer on, please feel free to contact me. You can email me at samantha at turningpointla.com. That's S-A-M-A-N-T-H-A at turningpointla.com. Until we're all together again, we love you and we miss you and we're praying for you and we wish you a very Merry Easter. Hi guys, my name is Jay and this is my wife Azine and together we lead the youth and family ministry at the Turning Point Church. If you're in middle school or if you're in high school, we want you to know that we have a lot going on that we're really, really excited about. If you're in the seventh grade or in the eighth grade, we have our Brian's ministry and they meet every Friday night at 730 for a great online devotional. And if you're in high school, we also have an online devotional every Friday night at 730 over Zoom. We also just added a really cool time with our guys at 4 p.m. on Mondays. And we're doing the same thing with the girls, but on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. So in spite of everything that's been going on in our world with quarantine and the coronavirus, this has actually been a really connective time within our ministry. We've loved having times every week where we can connect and share and talk about what's going on or talk about what we're learning and be able to engage everyone. If that sounds like something that you're interested in, we'd love to have you join us. So shoot us an email at connect at turningpointla.org and we'll get you the information you need so that you can join us this week. We're really looking forward to connecting with you. Happy Easter guys, this is David and Cece and we have the uh, privilege of uh, serving and working with the Turning Point Singles. That is an amazing ministry that I is striving to be authentic, bold, and connected. We have some wonderful people that are serving the poor, that are using their many talents to serve God in different ways. And we would love for you to join us. If you're single, uh, we would love to connect with you, and uh, especially with some of our online community groups that meet throughout the week. Uh, but one thing I'm really excited about is on Wednesdays, we are currently doing a free singles symposium on emotionally healthy spirituality. Uh, Jesus didn't die and resurrect in order for us to have an unhealthy spiritual life. Uh, that is not exciting. That is not invigorating. But to be single, to be emotionally healthy and spiritual all at the same time is what we are going for in this ministry. So please check us out. Good morning. I'm Mike Upton, this is my wife Kim, and we serve as the elder couple for the Turning Point Church. Thank you so much for joining us in this Easter worship this morning as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And thank you, Kevin, for the reminder about how we must adapt to the new realities of physical isolation and yet can nurture and develop our connection with each other through our community of friends and neighbors. While the number of days each of us has on earth are limited, and no matter whether that number is many or few, 
Jesus' resurrection proves that there's something in life that is worth striving for with all that we are. God is the ultimate storyteller. He has a story of his own, and we can all play a part in it. His is the best story ever told. We in The Turning Point are committed to finding our place in God's story and helping others to do the same. If you want to join us in that effort or are intrigued to find out more about his story or just need someone to talk to, please reach out to us. So let us pray together as we close. Dear God, a few weeks ago we may not have imagined what today would be in terms of our worship for you on this Easter service. And yet, God, we know we have a choice. We have a choice whether to despair of what we do not have or grab and even grow in our understanding of what can never be taken away from any one of us. Thank you for your message to love and serve each other, to grow in our giving of what you have given to us, and to share the great message of Jesus Christ. We love you, God. We praise you. And it's in Christ we pray all these things. Amen. Many of you may now be meeting in your community groups. If you'd like to join one of them, please contact us. And have a great Easter.